Our second lecture is going to focus on deep feed-forward neural networks without recurrent connections. Early supervised feed-forward networks in the 1950s had only one single layer, one input layer, one output layer, and they were essentially variants of linear regressors dating back at least two centuries to Gauss and Legendre around 1800. Actually, around 1800, Gauss was the one who um, performed the first famous example of pattern recognition when he uh, got data points from uh, an asteroid called Ceres, which disappeared behind the sun. And then the big problem was to find it again, to predict where it's going to appear. And Gauss um, um, put all the knowledge about celestial mechanics into a prediction machine, which had parameters. And then he used the method of least squares, which is attributed to both Legendre and Gauss, to um, adjust these parameters, to learn them basically from the observations, such that he could predict the, um, the new um, uh, observations uh, of Ceres, and that's what made him famous in very young years. The perceptron of uh, Rosenblatt in the 50s was very similar to these linear regressors. Deep learning in feed-forward neural networks, deep learning, started in 1965 in, uh, in the Ukraine, which was back then the USSR which uh, at that time was leading many fields of science and technology. They just had started the space age and they had the first object on the moon and the, or the first human made object on the moon and the, um, the biggest bomb of all time and the first person in space and the first woman in space and whatever. But maybe more importantly, they had many of the best mathematicians, and two of them were Ivaknenko and Lapa, who really had the first deep networks that reliably learned. So in 1965, Ivaknenko and Lapa published the first general working learning algorithm for supervised deep feedforward multi-layer perceptrons. And um, their method was still widely used in the new millennium. Their activations of their units were polynomial. So they had polynomial activation functions combining additions and multiplications in so-called Kolmogorov Gabor polynomials. And then they used um, um, regression to adjust the parameters and the uh, outputs of the first layer became the inputs of the second layer, and so on. And um, in 1971, Ivaknenko already described a deep network with eight layers, which is deep even by uh, the standards of the new millennium, with eight layers trained by this uh, method, which was still used in the 2000s. How does it work? Given a training set of input vectors with corresponding target output vectors, layers are incrementally growing. First the first layer, then the next layer, and so on. And they are trained by regression analysis, and then they are pruned with the help of a separate validation set. A separate validation set uh, where regularization is used to weed out all those feature detectors in the, in the current layer, um, which are superfluous. So. Uh, the validation set is used to identify superfluous units which are removed. And the numbers of layers and the units per layer, um, the number of units per layer, can be learned in a problem-dependent fashion. Like later deep neural networks, Ivaknenko's and Lapa's nets also learn to create hierarchical, distributed, internal representations of the input data, of the incoming data. They did not yet use the technique which is now used, uh, which is now known as backpropagation. Um, 
they, they did not use supervised learning through pure gradient descent because what Ivagnenko had there, he had um, uh, incremental uh, regression analysis to train the weights. And the alternative um, was uh, described also in um, around this time. Uh, if you want to do gradient descent in an objective function, such as the total classification error on a given training set of input patterns um, and, and the corresponding labels, then um, what's, what you want to do today is use this method, which is called backpropagation, or the reverse mode of uh, automatic differentiation, which was published in 1970 by a Finnish master student by Seppo Lina Inma in Helsinki. So um, the modern efficient version of backpropagation for sparse networks, including Fortran code, is due to um, Lina Inma 1970. Interestingly, Finland is a border state of the Soviet Union where the first deep learning emerged in 1965. And what Lina Inma did, he um, extended Kelly's early work from the 60s, which already used basic concepts of backpropagation. The nice thing is that the complexity of computing the derivatives of the output error with respect to each weight in the system, to each neural network weight in the system, is proportional to the number of weights. So you have the forward path, which is um, proportional in complexity to the number of weights, and you have the backward pass, which is uh, proportional um, to the number of weights in terms of complexity. And that's the method that is still used today. Um, Verbos in 1982 was the first to apply that method really to uh, neural networks because it's a general method that you can use for all kinds of applications. For example, in TensorFlow of Google um, and similar software packages, this method, the reverse mode of automatic differentiation or backpropagation is used to adjust the um, adaptable parameters in any um, computational graph with differentiable nodes. Uh, uh, between 1980 and 1990, computers became 10,000 times faster uh, per dollar than those of 1960 to 1970 when the backpropagation was invented and developed. And, um, and that was then good enough to, um, to do first experiments uh, with backpropagation on cheap or relatively cheap desktop computers, which just came up there around the mid-80s. And Rumelhardt and colleagues then showed that this method really can learn um, uh, internal representations in hidden layers. By 2003, deep uh, backpropagation-based back um, standard feed-forward neural networks with up to seven layers were already used to successfully classify high-dimensional data. There is a reference by Vieira and Baradas uh, of 2003 on that. The 1970s also saw the birth of the convolutional neural network architecture, the CNN architecture, and uh, that happened in Japan. Um, the CNN architecture was introduced by Fukushima. He called it the Neo Cognitron in 1979. It was inspired by uh, neurophysiological insights of Hubel and Wiesel. And today, such architectures are widely, widely used for computer vision. What's happening? There is um, a typically rectangular receptive field of a unit, or any of these units in the first layers of such a CNN, has a, a weight vector which is connected to this receptive field and, um, and the field is a filter which is shifted across an image, for example, step by step across a two-dimensional array of input values such that um, uh, the network is basically perceiving all the pixels of an image in, in a um, um, systematic uh, fashion. And usually you have not only one such filter but many of um, uh, such filters. The resulting array of 
Subsequent activation events of this unit can then provide inputs to higher level units and so on. And uh, due to massive weight replication, so you copy again and again the weights of, um, of these uh, filters to the next instance of the same filter, uh, due to massive weight replication, relatively few parameters may be necessary to describe the behavior of such convolutional layers, which typically feed into so-called downsampling layers, where you have a, a big previous layer which feeds into a smaller layer, uh, which is a downsampling layer in the sense that you get, in a sense, with lower resolution, the same information that you have in the previous uh, layer. And there are fixed weight connections which originate from physical neighbors in the convolutional layers below. Within this downsampling layer, you find these um, physical neighborship uh, preserving units. Downsampling units use um, spatial averaging to become active if at least one of their inputs is active um, and their responses are then insensitive to certain uh, small image shifts which is very useful in many vision applications. Um, Weng in 1993 later uh, replaced the spatial averaging of Fukushima by something uh, which is now widely used, which is called max pooling, which is um, a central ingredient of many CNNs. Here, uh, a two-dimensional layer or array of unit activations is uh, partitioned into, into um, subsections, into small uh, rectangular arrays, subarrays, and each of them is uh, very simple. Each is replaced in a downsampling layer by, um, uh, by the activation of its most active unit. In 1987, neural networks with convolutions were combined by uh, Weibel with uh, weight sharing and backpropagation because Fukushima didn't use backpropagation. He used other ways of adapting the parameters of his system. And Weibel was the one who um, combined these two concepts, gradient descent through backpropagation and convolutions. That also happened in Japan. Just one decade ago, in 2010, many people thought that deep neural networks cannot learn much without unsupervised pre-training. Um, a technique which I introduced myself in 1991 and which was later also championed uh, by others. Unsupervised pre-training just means you pre-process the data such that it becomes more compact and then um, downstream supervised learning becomes easier. And uh, in fact, um, around 2007, uh, one well-known researcher said that nobody in their right mind would ever suggest to use plain gradient descent through backpropagation to, um, to uh, train a deep neural network. Uh, I won't mention this uh, well-known researcher by name except to say that he is uh, Dr. Hinton. But then uh, my team with my outstanding postdoc, Dan Gérigian, in 2010 was able to show that indeed it's possible. You can train really deep networks by backpropagation without any unsupervised uh, pre-training. And back then, our team broke a famous benchmark record which um, was used, um, that benchmark has been, had been used by then for decades. And the way we did that was we achieved this by greatly accelerating traditional multilayer perceptrons on highly uh, parallel graphics processing units or GPUs, uh, going beyond the important uh, work on uh, GPUs by Jung and O, who in 2004 were the first guys who apparently had uh, working implementations of neural networks uh, on uh, graphics processing units. 
But then in 2010, it was really fast enough to train these deep networks, which seemed untrainable before, and a reviewer called this a wake-up call to the machine learning community. And then everybody started doing this. In the 2010s, uh, this little supervised deep learning revolution quickly spread from Europe to uh, North America and Asia. Our results set the stage for this recent decade of deep learning. In February 2011, our team extended the approach to deep convolutional neural networks, to the CNNs that I mentioned before, and this greatly improved earlier work. Our so-called DanNet, after Dan Girejan, who was the first author on these uh, publications, broke one record after another. In May 2011, DanNet was the first deep CNN to win a computer vision competition. In August 2011, it was the first CNN to win a vision contest with superhuman performance. And our team with Dan Girjan and Uli Meyer and others kept winning computer vision contests in 2012 in medical imaging and other fields. Subsequently, many researchers adopted this technique as well. By May 2015, we had the first extremely deep feedforward networks with not only 10 or 20 or 30 layers, but now with more than 100 layers. That was the highway networks made possible through my students Rupesh Srivastava and Klaus Greff. And a special case of the highway networks is called ResNets, which have become very popular. The original um, successes required a precise understanding of the inner workings of GPUs. Today, however, there are convenient software packages which shield the user from uh, such details. And, um, and compute is uh, now roughly 100 times cheaper than in 2010 when we um, were lucky enough to start this whole development.